Hello, everyone. This is Howie Jacobson, joined today by Joel McDonald. Hello, Joel. Hi, Howie. Good to see you. Yeah. And our you. guest tonight and our presenter is Ryan Levesque. Ryan, can we hear you? I'm right here loud and clear. Great to hear from you and be with you guys on the line. Great. So as you know, as people may know by now, I'm calling in from South Africa on Skype. If I start cutting in and out, just talk over me and... Uh, you guys take over because I, I don't like to annoy people with uh, with stuttering and long delays. Um, if everyone else can hear, if you could type in a, a hello or um, a, a PG-13 or below joke uh, into the question <laughs> box, that that way we'll know you're you're able to listen. Um, so let's let's get started um, right away. Hello, everybody. Oh, nice. Um, so. Um, we, we met Ryan through uh, Jack Bourne, who I met um, through Perry Marshall, and um, Jack immediately impressed me as having the, the sort of mind that could look at any funnel, any system, and find 12 ways to Sunday to improve it. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I when, and I actually found you when because for a Facebook post that Jack put up about a new piece of software, and I have not been spending money in South Africa. Um, I've been feeling really cheap. You know, the cost of living is kind of low here, and so I haven't bought any products or software or anything. And you know, it's really nice to like not have to work so hard and and not have to spend so much. But within like eight seconds of reading Jack's post, I went and bought it. Um, and then um, you know, wrote to you with some questions. We started talking, and I'm just I'm so impressed with the thinking behind the product, which is Survey Funnel. And so we started talking, and um, what what really interested me was the um, the theory that is baked into the product. And you really don't need the product to benefit from the theory. Although for you know for many people, including myself, it's much easier to to have something to, you know a piece of software that that embodies the theory. It just makes it easier to to do the right thing for prospects um, and customers. And really, the heart of what we're going to be talking about tonight is the fact that no matter what your traffic stream, uh, no matter how targeted it is. You still don't know what people want. You don't know what they care about. You don't know what they're thinking of. You don't know how they take in information best. And so what we do as marketers is we go through all these gyrations to create tests of landing pages. And so you might have you know, one landing page A that gets a 4% response, another landing page B gets a 3% response, and you'd say, well, landing page A is clearly better. And it clearly is better if all your, your only choice is A versus B. But Ryan, what you're going to talk about tonight is a way where you can have your cake and eat it too, where you can find out from people what they want and then give it to them on the fly. Um, exactly. So that's so that's you know as AdWords guys, we are we're always looking for ways to increase the value of a click, to connect better with our prospects once we get them onto the website, and so the stuff you were talking to us about it via email and via previous Skype chats. It was really, really exciting. And I have to add, it's stuff that I haven't really heard before. Cool. Um, so, so without further ado, just to, uh, to kind of frame where you're going with us, uh, Ryan Levesque, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Howie, for the, the kind and warm inter introduction. And I'm really happy to be here with you and really looking forward to just having an interesting conversation about all this stuff. Um, you know, I think everything that you said is true. And I think when, when anyone who might be listening to this call right now, I think the important thing is to, to think about how you might be able to apply some of the five psychological forces that we're going to talk about here in a minute in your, marketing, in your marketing, irrespective of whether or not the tool that we've developed is right for you. So in other words, these are principles that I think most people on this call will be able to find a place for in their marketing um, now, a year from now, ten years from now, these are sort of timeless principles that are that are grounded in human psychology. So, Great. so before we dive oh, right could, in, could I? Sorry, could I interrupt you for one one more piece of um, housekeeping? Oh, sure. um, so Ryan asked that we keep this real interactive. Uh, so if you have questions, 
just type them into the question box, and at appropriate times, Joel and I will 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 dive in with them. So don't don't be shy. Um, right. We're gonna we're gonna mix it up. If you got curveballs, um, fling them our way. Yeah, this is very. Um, there's a, there's a loose structure to this talk, but it's very extemporaneous. It's very spontaneous, and and one of the things is you'll find. Um, is true in this tool, I'm very keen on getting real-time feedback. So if there's something that we talk about that either doesn't make sense or you have a question or you disagree, um, just to echo, echo Howie's comment, you know, please raise your hand and let us know because I'd, I'd love to make this as interactive as possible. So first things first. So again, the, ti the title of the talk is How to Boost Your Conversion Rates Online Using These Five Powerful But Little Known Psychological Forces. And just the fact, Howie, that you mentioned that some of this stuff isn't something that you've heard anybody talk about before I think is very exciting, especially for people on the call who might have, you know, might think that they've heard it all, they've read every book out there, they've, they've bought every course out there, um, so that's pretty exciting. Now before we dive into the five forces, I just want to mention two things real quick, and, and that's, you know, why should you even bother paying attention to what we're going to be talking about? Well, there are two things, two highlights uh, in, in my background that I want to point out real quick, and that's, number one, I, before leaving academia, to pursue a career as a marketer. I actually have an academic background in neuroscience. I studied neuroscience at the Ivy League level at Brown University. I also taught the intro to neuroscience, Neuro One, two sections of that for two years at Brown. And I, I'm also a published researcher. I, I, my, my focus before becoming a marketer was brainstem development in prematurely born infants, newborns. So I have somewhat of an academic background in all this and have found a way, I think, that's unique to sort of talk about some of that stuff in the context of, of marketing. And number two, which is probably more interesting to people, is that I've, I've sold over in just a few short years in being a full-time marketer online, I've sold over a million dollars using the exact forces that we're going to be talking about in this call, and it's, and it's in markets that have nothing to do with how to make money or biz op or anything like that. These are, these are what I would consider real businesses. Um, and so uh, I just want people to bear in mind that before we dive right in. So without further delay, let's dive right into the first psychological force. Force number one is something called micro-commitments. Now, Howie, are you, is micro-commitment something that, that you're familiar with? Um, I think in, in some sense, yes, but uh, probably not to the extent that you're talking about. Okay, so, so what's a micro-commitment? Well, if you think about in, on your website, anytime that you ask your prospect or customer, anybody who visits your website to do something, you're asking them to take some type of commitment. Whether that commitment is clicking on a link, or that commitment is opting in and giving you their name and email, or buying something. Now, anytime you ask your prospect to make some sort of change or make some sort of commitment, at, 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 down to the neurological level, it's, it's scary. So in other words, it's scary to your prospect's brain to make any sort of change. Change is positive or negative. And so there's an actual, there's an actual neuroscientific sort of uh, phenomenon that's going on, and there's a part of your brain that's called the amygdala. Now the amygdala, I don't want to get into too much of the science, but I think it's important to understand this. The amygdala is the structure in your brain that controls the fight or flight response, which, as you'll discover in a moment, is probably more appropriately called the fight, flight, or freeze response. And so what happens is this. Anytime that either you or your prospect or really any human being is asked to make some sort of change, what happens is it, your amygdala fires off these warning bells. And it goes back to you know, caveman days when we would see you know, uh, you know, some rustling on the plains and the grass would move and our brain would say, is that a predator? Is that a gazelle or is that a lion? And so any sort of change would fire that warning bells off, that those warning bells off. And we're still hardwired with that, that neurological, that psychology, even in today's contemporary modern society. So the question is this, knowing that, knowing that neuroscientific background, knowing that any time you ask your prospect to do something on your website, it's scary to them, and you're eliciting that fight, flight, or freeze response, what's the solution? The solution is this, shrink the size of the commitment. So in other words, instead of right off the bat asking someone when they let reach your landing page to give you their name and email in exchange for a free report or a, um, you know, an autoresponder sequence that they're going to get, instead of asking to make that type of commitment, shrink that commitment to something smaller. So 
A real example might be, instead of asking them to opt in right away, you might say, hey, I have a report that's geared to, if you're in the weight loss industry, for example, you might say, I have a report that'll tell you everything you need to know to achieve your weight loss goals. But before I give you that report, tell me, which of the following is most important to you right now? Is it A, getting rid of the cellulite on your legs and butt? Is it B, get, getting rid of belly fat? Or is it C, achieving a specific weight goal in pounds that you have in mind? Just select which option is best for you and click next. See, by asking someone to make that type of micro-commitment and just select one option in a multiple choice scenario, what it does is it kind of warms things up. It builds action-taking momentum. Folks are, it's a much less scary commitment to make to click on a multiple choice answer like that than it is to give you their name and email right off the bat. And so when you do that, you can follow that up with another question. If they select, say, the cellulite option, you might say, okay, thank you for your response. Do you happen to be a man or a woman? And they might say, oh, I'm a woman. Next. And the next question that you might ask is, okay, um, which of the following best describes your age? Are you A, over the age of 60, B, between the ages of 40 and 59, or C, under the age of 40? And they might say, oh, I'm, you know, between the ages of 40 and 59. They click next. Then what you might present to them is this. Hey, it just so happens that I have a special report that's specifically geared to women between the ages of 40 and 59 who are looking to get rid of cellulite on their legs and butt. And I'll send you a free copy of it. All you need to do is give me your name and tell me what's the best email address to reach you at. So there's a huge difference between that process and the prototypical opt-in process, which is give me your name and email now. That's scary. And so um, the idea of micro-commitments is just a matter of shrinking down the commitment that you're asking your prospect to make in order to, to improve your conversion rates by breaking down the process into smaller steps. So does that, does that sort of make sense? Yeah. Now, one, one thing that I was taught uh, early on was, you know, never, the, the more clicks that people have to make, the more likely they are to fall off. So, you know, you, ideally you want the entire form to be on the one page, you want the entire sales letter to be one scrolling page, and don't make them click, because, you know, every, every click is like a, uh, you know, a, a crevasse that they have to jump over and most people just fall through. How do you, how do you respond to that? You know, I think that's a, that's a strong counter argument, definitely. I think the, the answer to that is this. It, if you were to graph it out and, 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 and decide, well, what's the optimal scenario? It probably looks like a bell curve. So in other words, your conversion rate is going to go up, bit, you know, at a, up to a certain point. And then if you ask for too many steps, people, you know, will wonder, well, get to the point. What the hell's the point of all this? And it's going to drop off. So what I've found, and I've done a lot of testing in this, is the optimal number of steps to ask people to make, to make before opting in is about three. Any more than that, and people start to fall off. Any less than that, it's not that people start to fall off. It's that you just, one of the things that we'll get to in a moment is that you can't get enough useful information that you can use that information to better fine tune your marketing. So now this is going to vary from market to market, and again, this is something to test by all means, but what I've found is that three steps is, is what's performed best in the tests that I've run. Hmm. Well, that, yeah, that makes sense from my perspective uh, as an amateur stand-up comedian, <laughs> where, sort of, ev where everything, you know, everything comes in threes. And it's right. almost like you know you you expect the third thing. In fact, my my daughter and I were 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 sharing these like um, um, high five sort of visual jokes where you pretend to high five <laughs> someone and then you you move your hand back as a jellyfish and she and I was sharing some with her and she was explaining that they have to go in threes. Right. If, right. You know, if it's just if it's just two, you leave them hanging. Right. No, and that's and that's a great point. Um, and there's a there's a place to leave people hanging, which is actually something that we're going to get to in the next psychological force. But you know, the only, um, you know, I, I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to, to, to talk about in terms of micro-commitments. Um, if there's anything else that comes up, if there are questions, then, you know, again, by all means, you know, please, I, I can't see the questions on my screen, so I'll, let you, I'll ask either you or Joel just to, you know, okay. to scream and shout yep. and, and interrupt me. We're mon we have one right now from someone who is wondering if you would be able to share the businesses in which you made the million outside the make money niche. <laughs> sure. One of the one of the businesses. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this as an as actually an open loop. And the reason why is this: 
the, the piece of software that we have that's going to encapsulate everything that uh, we talk about today, in that demo, in the demo for that software, I actually reveal one of those businesses and show this tool in action in a real life business. And I'll, I'll say this, it's, as someone with a background in neuroscience, it's, the business is in the mind expansion space and it has to do with, has to do with improving your mind and memory. Okay. So folks, folks will be able to see that. All right. Force Fair number enough. two is using open loops. And the op an open loop is something that I actually just did. So what I did is I, I planted a seed. I mentioned something, and I, and I created essentially a cliffhanger. So anyone who's on this call wondering, you know, where did you make those millions, you know, and curious to, to find that out, they're going to be interested enough to probably check out that demo just to see what the business is in action. And so an open loop is nothing more than a cliffhanger. And when you look at the world of television and movies, they've, you know, movie producers and television producers have mastered the art of the open loop. The open loop is the, the annoying thing that happens right before the commercial break that makes you, you know, stick around and not put the remote control down. It's a thing that bugs us. And there's, there's an interesting psychology behind that and why that's so powerful. But it's just, you know, an open loop is nothing more than, you know, you're watching a, a, a trivia show or something like that, and, and, you know, they, right before the commercial the break, they say, you know, what, what's the population of Portugal? Is it A, B, or C? Stay tuned after the break, and we'll give you the answer. And you're like, I want to know. <laughs> and and what, what happens is it creates this sort of chemical cocktail in your brain when an open loop is presented. And I'm giving you this backstory because it's important because I'm going to give some examples of how people might be able to introduce this in their marketing. But I think it's important to understand the psychology and the neuroscience because it's something that we're all hardwired. So when you introduce an open loop, like one of those cliffhangers, what happens is it creates this neurochemical cocktail in your brain or your prospect's brain. And it causes the, the simultaneous release of two neurotransmitters. The first neurotransmitter is dopamine, and dopamine is a neurotransmitter of desire. And the second neurotransmitter that's released is adrenaline, or what we in the United States call, or we call it adrenaline, but overseas it's called epinephrine. And so it creates this, this cocktail in your brain of simultaneous tension and desire. And when you introduce a cliffhanger in open loop, it causes your prospect's brain to almost salivate wanting what it is that you've that seed that you've planted, but you haven't given them the payoff. And the mental cocktail or the chemical cocktail is something that I call sort of like a, a vodka Red Bull. It's like this perfect blend where you've got this stimulus and you have this sort of relaxed state. And it creates the, the perfect mental state to get people salivating over what it is that you're going to present to them. So that's the background. Um, you know, we, we just went through, I just, you know, right here live talked about <laughs> used an open loop unintentionally. But when it comes to using open loops in your marketing, it's, it's something that you can use throughout pretty much everything that you do. So in the opt-in process, you can introduce open loops by, by doing, if we go back to the weight loss example that we just talked about. You know, it just so happens that I have a, a, a report that's specifically geared towards women who are looking to get rid of fat on their legs and butt, the cellulite on their legs and butt, and for women who are between the ages of 40 and 59. Now, to get the report and find out what's in it, all you need to do is give me your name and email. That, that would be an example of an open loop, because it leaves people wondering, well, what is it that's specific about being a woman between the ages of 40 and 59 and getting rid of cellulite on, on your legs and butt? What is it specific in that report that has to do with someone, or that, that can help someone in my specific situation? Another example of open loop and open loop is in your copy, whether it's email copy or in a sales letter copy. One of the devices that you can use is, you know, for example, in an email, you might say, hey, P.S., uh, stay tuned for tomorrow's email because in tomorrow's email, I'm going to reveal the answer to the question that I posed in today's email. So stick around and be sure to check out that email for me tomorrow. So you've, you've created this cliffhanger and you've created the state where people got to have what it is that you've that you've put in front of them. So does that, does that make sense so far? Yep. Um, I, I have a question. Are you, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so there's, there seems to be like, like there's two different types of open loops. 
Okay. One is one that I recognize, you know, as, as the recipient of the marketing, I mm -hmm. recognize that this is an open loop. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that I know that you've done this because you want me to, to hang on until the commercial and find out the, the population of Portugal or, uh, and I, I find that the one that, um, that is much more powerful for me is one where I think that I thought of the question myself. You're right. Like I'm sitting and, I, and I'm wondering, you know, you know, it's like when I listen to a, a great interviewer and they ask the question that I was just thinking. Like uh. I feel like if, I feel like a huge flush of pleasure, and so if I'm, you know, if, if I'm thinking, if they've, if they've, done, if they've created the open loop in a way that seems unintentional or effortless, then when they, when the reveal comes, it, it feels like it's, you know, scratching a much more intimate itch. Like, oh yes, right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a really great point that you raise, and I think, I think you're right. I think it's, it just comes down to, to skill level of the marketer and sometimes it's unintentional right what you're talking about but I think a lot of times it's like watching a professional athlete that makes something extremely difficult look effortless right you have to reach that they, they, they've already passed through that threshold of learning the mechanics and doing something that takes a tremendous amount of effort and skill to reach that effortless point so I think a lot of that depends on the skill of the marketer but but here's the thing whether or not you as a you know even when when you as a you 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 are a prospect whether or not you recognize it or not the effect is still there the effect is still powerful right just like with the commercial break if you really want to get the answer to that trivia question even if you know that it's just a device that the TV show is using to get you to stick around after the commercial like you still want it right so what's interesting about everything that we're talking about is on on one hand it's something it these are things that you can use in your marketing. On the other hand, what I find really useful as a consumer is to try to recognize my own response and my own behavior patterns when I'm presented with something like this. So if you attend a webinar and someone says, stick around to the end of the webinar because I have, I'm going to give you my number one money-making secret that I've picked up last month and it's something that made me $10,000 in the last 30 days. I'm not going to give it to you now and the reason why is because you have to understand everything we talk about on the webinar first, but stick around to the end because I'm going to reveal that to you just as a way of saying thank you for being on the call with us. Right? That's very intentional. That's very premeditated as an open loop, but it's effective. It works and that's why people use them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's, um, I guess with your neuroscience background, you're saying that these, these chemical cocktails kind of have us a little bit on a leash, that our brains can't help but respond in, in the, you know, to, to moving towards that pleasure and resolving that tension. You've, you've wafted the piece of uh, roasting meat in front of the dog's <laughs> nose. <laughs> you want to think about it like that for, for as, as, a, as a powerful visual. And what does the dog do? The dog is salivating after that piece of meat. His eyes are fixated on that piece of meat. And you've created this state where you've almost hypnotized the dog, and the dog will do whatever you want him to. He'll roll over. He'll give you his paw. He'll do whatever. Now, the reason why I say that is not to compare your prospects and your market to dogs. What I'm saying is that we're hardwired down to a mammalian level with this response. And so this is something that is occurring at a very primitive level in our brains, in our reptilian brains or our mammalian brains. So it's something that's there. And, and one of the things I didn't bring up on the beginning of this call is that the stuff that we're talking about here is extremely powerful. And, and we, didn't, we didn't mention this at the beginning of the call, but you know, I would ask that anybody who is on this call makes a promise both to themselves and to us that these forces are going to be used for good. Just like the force in Star Wars, there's the Sith and there are the Jedis. And the force can be construed and manipulated for bad just as well as it can be for good. And so the way that I look at it is these are forces that you can use to inspire your prospects and your market to take an action that will lead them towards a positive goal or outcome that they're trying to achieve. So if you're, in other words, if you're selling cigarettes to teenagers, you know, hang up now because I, I don't, I, I don't want you on the call. But, but if you're doing, if you're using this for good, then I think these are very powerful things that can help you get your message across to your market in a very crowded, and otherwise very crowded, competitive environment. Hey, I want to chime in on that real quick. Go ahead, Joe. Because I think 
<clears throat> this is something we all struggle with as business owners, and I used to struggle with um, as a salesperson and managing my staff of salespeople about you know not being too pushy versus you know making sure that you you are for lack of a better word a little on the pushy side because mm -hmm. in real estate what I had to convince my real realtors of because we were very picky with who we hired we only had top-notch realtors who were gave top-notch service and so on and in that respect you almost have to think of things from the opposite perspective this isn't about manipulating people to get them to buy your crap this is because you have something that you are proud of and you owe it to your customers to do everything in your power to buy your stuff versus your other stuff your competitors which is inferior so I mean in some cases it's not just a matter of you know manipulating people into buying your box of crap it's because you have a superior product and when you have something that you truly believe in you know it's it, it's not nearly as bad as it sounds and you know and you are using it for good purposes because you have something that can solve their needs and I think that's a, there's a big difference when you have that mindset and when you have that mindset these types of things become a lot more acceptable and a lot less manipulative exactly I mean it's your duty and obligation to be doing this because otherwise I mean I would go even a step further if you are letting your prospect buy an inferior product from your competitor you are doing them a disservice if you're not doing everything in your power using every tool in your arsenal to get them to make the best possible decision in their best interest then then you're a, 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 neg a net negative contributor to society so when you look at it that way and you feel like you have a duty and responsibility to be to be to be using everything at your disposal then I think you're right Joel it 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 when you frame it like that it allows you to market ethically and authentically with as much passion and and force and energy as necessary to to get your point across or to get your message across mm. and I, I would I would add one thing to that which is when you you, know, you the example you used is I'll, t I'll give you my, my top money-making secret at the end of the webinar. Um, and I think all of us have been on webinars where, you know, we, we're promised in the, in the sales copy, in the email, all this information, and we're sitting there wondering, when is it going to start? <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> right. 40 minutes later, we're still seeing pictures of the guy's trip to Disney. <laughs> Right. I, I, I uh, promise you there'd be no Maseratis and, uh, and uh, women in bikinis in front of my McMansion. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a family but, you know, it, I'm married and happy, but yeah. <laughs> if, you know, in, in fact, when, you know, if you open loops and you don't close them you know, to people's satisfaction, what you're doing is you're sort of eroding the commons. And I'm not talking about like a commons, like you know, our clean air or water or grazing, but the tr the trust commons. And so that, you know, to me, it's very important as a marketer that whatever I do makes pe people more trusting and not more cynical. Right. Uh, so so that if I'm if I'm opening a loop, if I'm if I'm promising something, I want to make sure that the thing I deliver is at least twice as good as what I said. Because people are already discounting it in their minds. Right. I mean, it's it's the overpromise, under under deliver thing. It'll never, when you when you approach everything that you do with that, it'll it'll never just serve you. And if you always deliver 10x value for what from what you're charging, you'll have a customer for life. And so, I think anybody who operates and acts in 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 that way um, will have a very long term successful business. And and the folks who don't, they'll get the trial, but they won't get repeat. And the repeat is where all the money is made. Right. Now, just one other real basic question. Um, so yeah. we, we talked about open loops and kind of the more obvious ones where you're using that as an enticement to uh, enter their name and email. Do you also use that? Uh, do you kind of embed it into the questions along the way? So we're gonna, you're going to show us a little bit down the road of you know, questions you ask. Do you have strategies you use so that the questions you ask are in fact open loops? The questions that you ask, and it's it's something that people who are interested to see the survey funnel tool in action will get to see how I'm using it in in, in one of my live businesses right now. But to answer your question, you want to ask questions that are leading in a certain way that 
give that elicit a response that's I wonder where he's going with this. Like I'm, I'm, how does this mm -hmm. how how does this kind of you know, where is this all going to play out? And so it's it, they're curious, they're curiosity inducing questions. So it's not about you know it's not just about you know gender and age. I mean even though we use that example um, to talk through, you know we you want to ask questions that people want to know. Interesting. No one's ever asked me that before. How does that relate to topic X, right? Like for example, you might say, "Which of the following is your favorite? Is your is is which of the following television shows have you watched?" And maybe you ask that question in a weight loss market, and the question is designed to funnel people into one of several buckets based on an interest profile. So for example, maybe you've done some work with Facebook. Maybe you've done some right angle marketing on Facebook where you've looked at your customer base and you've looked at what are their favorite books, what are their favorite movies, what are the activities that they do outside of your market. Well, when you can find those connections, for example, folks who are in the weight loss market who, who, who mentioned The Secret as their favorite book versus folks in the weight loss market who mentioned The Bible as their favorite book, those might be two remarkably different segments in your market, but by asking them the question, which of the following books do you prefer, the secret or the Bible? Maybe that's not the best, that's sort of a off the top of my head example, but by asking a question like that, people might be wondering, how the hell does this relate to weight loss? But what you know is based on your market is that those two, those two people represent different profiles in your market and they need to be marketed to differently. So, so that's, a, that's a type of question that you might ask if you were to set up one of these, excuse me, sort of micro-commitment surveys. And as kind of an example just on that, so if they said the secret, um, you might say, how the hell does this relate to whatever in your sales copy? And if they said the Bible, you might say, how the heck do they? <laughs> yeah. You have to, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm I, very I generalizing, but sorry. Okay. I couldn't okay. resist. I'm going to try to keep this PG-13 tops. I, I think H-E double hockey stick is, is a word that they allow in PG-13 movies. And I think they allow one four-letter word in a PG-13 movie used judiciously. But I'll try to refrain, refrain from anything that could offend um, younger ears on the call. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, can we move on to force number three? Absolutely. Sure. Okay, cool. So force number three actually ties right into force number two. And it's something that I call the attention sweet spot. So in force number two, we talked about open loops and how you elicit that sort of vodka Red Bull mental cocktail that's going on in your prospect's brain, that perfect storm of neurochemicals that are floating around. Well, the caveat or the, the catch to all that is that chemical cocktail doesn't last forever. You create it, you create a spike, it's there for a brief period of time. It's ephemeral. It doesn't last forever. So you need to, you need to strike while the iron's hot. And the, the scientific literature will say that that sweet spot, that attention sweet spot, is roughly 20 minutes. So what that means is when you introduce an open loop, you have roughly 20 minutes to close that loop, 20 minutes to satisfy that desire, because otherwise your prospects lose interest. So when you've been on these, and I don't know how long this webinar is going is, is, is to be because it's sort of um, spontaneous, so I'm saying this perhaps tongue-in-cheek or perhaps it's going to be more of a do-what-I-say-not-what-I-do situation, but if you've been on webinars before that are two hours long or three hours long and, and they just seem to go on and on or you read a sales letter that takes you, you know, three days to get through, you might question that knowing that the attention sweet spot only lasts roughly 20 minutes. So, so what I've done in my marketing is what I, what I try to do is whenever I have a sales letter, I try to make it that the average prospect in my market could get through it. Once an open loop is introduced, that they could close the loop within the 20 minutes so that if it's trying to sell them on buying a product, that they could buy that product within 20 minutes. When you produce something like a video sales letter, it's a lot easier to whittle that down to 20 minutes because you know exactly how long that video sales letter takes. So when, when folks who are perhaps interested in checking out the survey funnel tool, you'll find that I use a video sales letter to demonstrate the tool in action. And you'll notice that that video sales letter is less than 20 minutes long. And it's done so consciously and purposely because that 20 minute time frame sort of corresponds to the attention sweet spot, that brain chemical cocktail. Any thoughts or questions on, on that one or do you wanna jump right into force number four? Well, can you, uh, can you recharge it? 
Oh, of course. And so what you can do is use what I call nested open loops. So you can introduce an open loop, and movies do this beautifully, right? Movies will, and I know how you're, you know, a student of Joseph Campbell and, and the hero's journey and sort of the, the you know, the, the great movies of our time, but if you look at any one of the great movies, like a Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or whatever, what, what have you, you notice that they introduce multiple storylines. They'll introduce a storyline, bring it to a point of tension, and then they'll move, they'll move to something else. So in Star Wars, it might be a galactic star, fri star fight that then moves to a lightsaber fight that then moves to another sort of ground fight against stormtroopers, right? And, and all three of the original Star Wars, you could, you could probably come up with countless examples of, of how um, the story jumps from one storyline to another. And really, those are just a series of nested open loops. But if you were to time those movies, I would be very curious to know how long it takes to go back to each storyline. So in other words, I would venture a guess that a storyline is, if a storyline is introduced in the first five minutes of the movie, it doesn't take two hours to revisit that storyline. They're constantly revisiting every storyline within a 15 to 20 minute period, and then just using those nested open loops or nested cliffhangers within one another to maintain that tension, to maintain that desire, to get you through the movie. And I would, and I would, I would even go further and say that movies that don't do a good job of doing that those are the movies that cause you to yawn and look down at your watch and say, man, this, you know, th th this, this is a long movie. The movies that just keep moving and keep you captivated and, and riveted, those are the movies that do the best job of using open loops and leveraging that attention sweet spot. All right. That reminds me of the, uh, the, the, the series of novels that, have, that has been engrossing me for the past few months, which is Game of Thrones. <laughs> um, <laughs> They've got you hooked. <laughs> and... You know the the first the first three books are th there's about twelve I guess different characters who each have a, a sort of a central storyline and he keeps going back and forth and leave you know leaving each each character in some bad situation and then going to the next one and the reviews for the first three books in the series have been fantastic and then for the fourth book apparently the the author uh, George R R Martin um, completely abandoned some of the characters to focus on others and the reviews are horrendous from people who are <laughs> loving it who are you know his biggest fans are like you know what happened to Daenerys there's nothing about Daenerys in book four and, and it's you know and the writing's the same he's the same guy he's telling the same story but he stopped doing the the quickly fulfilled open loops and people are, are going you know ape that's really interesting. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. And I think folks listening to this call, the, the question you might be asking yourself, well, how do you integrate this into your marketing? Well, the best, the best way to do it is to find a way to integrate that, that concept of serial fiction and storytelling in your market in some way. Because stories are, you know, they're, they're the language that people respond to. A story is so much more powerful to use to deliver your message than to out, outwardly just go on and say it. And so to the extent that you can, using stories, introducing open loops in those stories, and for example, email is such a fantastic medium to do this because it lends itself well to that serial novel, that, that set of installments. And so you can use email, instead of just sending each email in a vacuum, you could do a little bit of thinking ahead of time and say, well, let me write a five email sequence, each one referencing the previous one, each one with an open loop that gets people to read the next one, and you'll have a captivated audience that you, you, you'll notice that your click-through rates and your open rates and your emails will, will, will jump when you do that sort of thing. And it has to do with, with leveraging that, that, uh, that attention sweet spot and leveraging that, that chemical cocktail that you create in your prospect's brain. So, any questions, Joel, on, on this one before we jump to number four? Nothing from me. Cool. So force number four is something that I call opt-in reverse psychology. Now, we're switching gears a little bit in this force. It doesn't necessarily map back one-to-one -one with everything we've talked about so far, but it's, it's very powerful. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk through the standard opt-in process in most markets. In most markets, what you'll find is that nine out of 10 competitors are there standing on their tippy toes in a crowd, waving their hands, everyone trying to be waving higher than the next, saying, look at me, look at me, my solution is the best. And so they have headlines that scream, you know, get the absolute number one best weight loss 
solution in the, on the planet. Or the, you know, check out this free report. It gives you the best secrets ever for, you know, blowing out the traffic to your website, whatever it may be. You look at most markets, everyone takes that same approach. Everyone's screaming at the top of their lungs for your prospect's attention, trying to say, look at me, look at me, I'm the best. The reverse psychology to the opt-in process is this. Instead of saying, look at me, look at me, we're the best, what you do is you lead with a big benefit, but then you do a pull away or a take away, which might be, you know, discover the number, you know, you know, we are the number one financial services firm in the nation 10 years in a row. We have the best returns of anybody among all our competition. However, we only work with a few select clients. And before we can decide if you are a good fit for our firm, you need to demonstrate that you qualify. And to demonstrate that you qualify, what you need to do is this. First, answer the three simple questions that you see below, then enter your name and email, and I'll tell you if you're a good fit for what we do. And so what you've done there is you sort of flip the opt-in process on, on its head. You've gotten people excited about the, 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 the possibility of working with this, with this firm or in this fictitious example, but you've done a takeaway. You've said, we don't work with everybody. You need to demonstrate that you qualify. And then when you ask questions that are curiosity-inducing, what happens is this. The prospect, in this case, wants to know, well, what does it take to qualify? How might I qualify? And so they start thinking, and they become curious. And the fact that you've created that, you've elicited that curiosity, and you've done that takeaway sell, because as, as we all know, we all want what we can't have. The grass is greener on the other side. Um, what happens is it can dramatically boost your opt-in rates, because folks are curious to find out if they, if they qualify. They're curious to know if they're a good fit, and they want what they, not, they can't necessarily have uh, any, you know, uh, by default. And so that's, that, that's what I call opt-in reverse psychology. And it's something that I use extensively in my marketing now. And I'll, I can give an example of, of how I use it, but, but I'm very curious, Howie and Joel, um, sort of what your, what your initial thoughts are to this. Because I know this is one of the more um, contentious uh, you know, principles that I, that I talk about. And it, it usually elicits a, either a disagreement or, uh, or, or some sort of uh, argument. Um, well, I'll, I'll chime in, um, and my, my perspective here is, I guess Jack Bourne, your partner, um, came up with, um, with something that Perry Marshall's been talking about a lot, the, uh, the tactical triangle, mm -hmm. um, and it's you know, beyond the scope of this call, but if you go you know, Google Perry Marshall tactical triangle, you'll probably find something on it, and it's, it is just brilliant. And the the um, the punchline is that when you when you when you look at it the right way, the the biggest marketing advantage comes from the difference between the perceived value of what you do uh, and charge. Mm. Like that's that's the ultimate leverage. Right. And 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 therefore. You know, and the way you communicate that the best is with a guarantee that nobody else can match. Mm -hmm. And so, the, you know, when, when Perry talked about this, I did a, a live Camp Checkmate um, in Chicago a couple of years ago. Joel, you, you remember maybe Perry's talk. Um, about shoes? He said that, that was his other one. That was okay. the 80-20 talk. Um, that what you want to do is to be able to offer a guarantee that is so amazing that everyone's going to say, wow, um, I can't lose. And right. the only way you can do that is by disqualifying. Right. So you see, he sees sales as a disqualification process. And right. I was listening to that, now, and, now, and Perry's serious about it. So you know, this, can, this, this reverse psychology can be contentious if you don't really mean it. Right. If you're just sort of asking people to jump through hoops to make yourself seem more desirable and that you know in that way it's it's no different from like you know the the pickup artists right. who you know play, play on girls with with poor self esteem by putting them down right. and making them um but you know but i i th I've thought about this a lot cuz perry um you know has earned a great deal of respect for me over the years for his um his tactics and his ethics um 
And what I, I came to something that was very profound for me, and, and it has to do with like the one of the one of the curses of being a marketer is that we learn very early that we've got to go chase the money, mm -hmm. and we start we think and we, and what you can end up doing is discounting the value of what you provide, right? Because money is money is worth more than it, so. So in a sense you can sort of you can lose a little bit of respect for yourself and you can lose sight of the the infinite value that you represent in the world because you're trying you know you're trying so desperately to sell it for money and what reversing the process does for me is it helps me recognize my worth as being greater than any amount of money that someone could give me Right. That's a really good point. Especially if you're involved in any sort of service-oriented business where you, where it, you, you, it, it forces you to use your time to sell what you're doing. Because we all have a limited amount of time and it forces you, well, it doesn't force you, but it allows you to almost, like you said, value your time and, 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 and you reframe it. Instead of chasing after the, whatever deal comes your way, you're able to say, well, prove to me that working with you is, is, worth, is worth my time, number one, and that we're a good fit. Demonstrate that you're a good fit to work with me. And so when you flip it on its head like that, I think you're absolutely right. And from a selfless standpoint, what I've found, and I've, and I've, and I've done this both ways, I've done it the right way, and I've done it the wrong way, when you position yourself like that, people will value what you say so much more, and they'll actually implement your advice versus if you're the one that's chasing they'll look at it and they won't implement it as often and if at the end of the day what you're trying to do is get people again if you're trying to inspire people to make a change that leads them in a positive direction or to reach their goal then that's exactly what you're doing by by using that reverse psychology so I think that's I I, I definitely agree with you there Right, and we've got a couple of uh, of comments um, validating <laughs> that. Um, someone says this is my favorite method for high end sales. Use it for ten years in all types of sales. And someone else writes, when you get something too easy, people will take it because they always want something free. In reverse psychology, you make it work for them, so it sort of qualifies a real motivated prospect. Right. You know, one uh, a major company. So I'll give you an example of of who who uses this. A company that mo many people will be familiar with. It's a company called Force Factor, and they sell one of the best selling um, uh, fitness supplements on the in the United States. And what they do is they say, you know, sign up to get a free free uh, sample of our product. However, before we can give you a free sample, you need to first demonstrate that you qualify. And what they do is they ask a few simple questions that are designed to do two things. Number one, they're designed to, to, to figure out if the person is a good fit for the supplement. Because if, for example, if, you, if you're someone who's morbidly obese and you, you can't step into a gym, you're probably not a good fit for this. So they ask a few questions that are designed around that. They ask a few questions designed around age. Because if you're under the age of 18, if you're over the age of 70, you might not be a good fit for the product. But at the same time, they also ask a few questions designed to figure out what type of person are you. Are you someone who works out you know, five days a week and runs marathons in your spare time? Are you the occasional gym rat? Or are you someone that lives a mostly sedentary life but you're looking to get back into shape? And by asking those questions, they're able to, one, qualify their prospects, but two, they're also able to simultaneously segment their prospects. And that's something that we haven't talked about, but that's something when we get to how SurveyFunnel works that ties everything that we're doing, it ties everything that we're doing together. So I think that covers reverse psychology, and if, unless you guys have objections, I'm going to move on to force number five. Go for it. Okay, cool. So force number five is something called the Forer effect. Some people might be familiar with this as being called the Barnum effect. But the Forer effect, for anyone who isn't familiar with it, is basically this. The Forer effect is a term in psychology that describes a phenomenon that in your brain or in your prospect's brain, whenever we go through something like a personality test or a um, sort of like a strengths finder quiz or even a horoscope or a, you know, reading a fortune cookie, 
our brain has this natural tendency to want to ascribe the results of that quiz test or personality test or horoscope to, as being true to us. So in other words, it's this natural thing that our brain, when we go through a personality test, a Myers-Briggs test, we read that test and we think, hey, that applies to me. When in reality, the results of that test are just a series of highly generalized statements that could apply to a number of people. And there's a funny example of this. If you go on YouTube at some point and you, um, and I don't know exactly what you might, might search for on YouTube, but basically John Stossel um, did this expose where he put it back in, I think, the early 90s, where he put a whole bunch of people in a room, and I think it was a personality test. He had them take a personality test, and he gave them the results of it, and they, he went around the room and said, you know, ask the people, like, how does this apply to you? You know, is it true? And, you know, do you think that this was accurate? Yes, no. And more than 80% of the room raised their hands and said, this is definitely me. This is so accurate. It's super true. And then he said, well, would you be surprised to know that every single one in the, in the room has the same test results? And you should have seen the faces on these people. They were shocked. And even beyond that, this is actually the personality test of a serial killer. And they were even more shocked. And so the point of that is this. It's the four effect at play. When someone takes a quiz or a test like that, they think, they immediately, their brain goes into this mode where they're saying, yes, this is true. How does this apply to me? Okay, so that's the backdrop. That's the, that's the backstory to how you can start applying this in your marketing and how you can do it in an ethical and authentic way. And I'll get to that in a second. So what you can do is, if we go back to that example and say the weight loss example that we started talking about at the beginning of the conversation, you know, tell me, which of the following best describes you? Are you looking to A, get rid of the cellulite on your legs and butt, B, get rid of stomach fat, or C, lose a specified amount of weight? And then you ask a few other questions beyond that. And you say, hey, it just so happens that I have a customized solution for folks who are in your situation. When you do that, what happens is this. People enter their name and email and sign up for your ethical bribe, for your free report or autoresponder series or whatever it may be. And they start to look at that through the lens of, yes, this does apply to people in my situation and here's why. And when people look at your solution through that lens, they're much more likely to convert because they interpret whatever you put in front of them as being personally tailored to people in their situation. So what you'll find is that the unethical application of this is to present your product in that light but not make it customized or personalized to them. Just presenting it and framing it as being personalized. The ethical way is to either reposition your product Maybe, a, maybe, maybe your product is something that works for people in five different types of situations. But in your marketing, by asking people these questions, you can frame it in the one way that makes sense to this prospect. So if it's a nutritional supplement, maybe it's a, a wellness product for baby boomers and seniors to stay healthy. It could be a weight loss product for people who are losing to, looking to lose weight. Or it could be a fitness product for people who are looking to build muscle mass. Maybe your product can, be, can work for each of those three segments. But when you ask people these questions and you say, I have a supplement that's specifically geared to seniors who are looking for a wellness product to you know, stay healthy and have strong bones, well, you can focus your marketing around those specific benefits. So that's one application. The other application is this. You can funnel people into a different product based on which how they answer those questions. And the questions, again, are geared towards presenting them with a quote-unquote customized or tailored set of solutions. And that's the four effect at play. So that sound is me getting a sip of water here. Um, Howie Joel, um, I saw some typing going back and forth. I don't know if that was geared towards me, but I'm, I'm in full screen mode right now. So um, I don't know if those are questions that people are asking, but uh, <clears throat> if, if, any, if there are any questions that are popping up or things that you want to talk about, I'd, I'm, I'm happy to dive in. Um, well, someone had a question about the relationship of the four effect to confirmation bias, whereby you, you see what you expect to see. I guess, uh, you, I, you I call think Simon highly, effect. They're highly, they're highly related. They're highly related. But the four effect takes it further. The, the four effect is specifically geared towards running people through a, a survey or a test of some sort. 
And so the John Stossel example is the personality test at play. And in the context of this conversation, it's the idea of putting someone through a simple three to five question survey that allows you to sort of identify what type of prospect they are, what bucket they might fall in within your market, and then presenting them with either marketing that's customized to who they are or a product that's customized to who they are. Because when you do that and you frame it in those terms, they interpret your solution as being personally geared towards them. And just think about it. If you were to go to, like I'll give you an example. My son is, is two months old now. And we went to the drugstore the other day to pick up some sunscreen for him. Now, a two-month-old needs a very specific type of sunscreen. You can't just slap on, you know, the copper tone, you know, 45 SPF standard stuff that, you know, adults use. So they have, um, you go to the sunscreen aisle at any drugstore in the United States, there are like a thousand different types of sunscreen and your, your, your brain will explode if you don't go prepared, I swear to God. So you, I got there and I was looking at the sunscreen for newborns and the sunscreen for sensitive skin and the one with organic ingredients and all natural ingredients and then by, by the end of it you've got like six different things of sunscreen in your arms and if you turn them over um, and look at the ingredients, you'll find that of the ones I just mentioned, they're all the same. It's the same product inside the bottle, but they're all just positioned differently. One is positioned for newborns, one is positioned for sensitive skin, one is positioned as all natural ingredients, but they're all the same. But what they're doing is they're catering the same product to different buyers. Now, had I gone into the store and there was no specific customized uh, sunscreen for newborns, I probably would have walked out of the store empty-handed even though the ingredients are the same. And the reason why is because I wanted something that was customized and personalized to the specific situation that I was looking for. So when you think about that and, and sort of look at your own products or your own marketing, you know, just telling people that your product is all things to all people is no longer enough. You need to present it as being specifically geared to, you know, you in XYZ situation. And I'm sure, I mean, I can't speak for you guys, but I know in my businesses, We'll get questions all the time that'll, that'll be to the effect of, hey, does your product or course work for people in XYZ situation like me? And that's what people want to know. They want to know, does it work? Will it work for me? Will it work for someone like me? And, to the, and when you can present your marketing under that, in, in that context as being customized, you, you can dramatically improve your conversion rates, number one. You can also reduce the load on your customer service people because they're no longer answering these those types of questions. And so there's a huge benefit to both your business and your prospects by doing that. Okay. There's there's a comment by someone who's wondering about the the ethics of say if a product works for three different groups, let's say um, you know, triathletes, runners, cyclists or swimmers. Mm -hmm. Is it unethical to promote it as being specifically tailored for, let's say, just runners? So the runners read it and go, oh, this is just for runners, and the swimmers read it and go, oh, this is just for swimmers. You know, I think ethics is one of these things that, you know, I'm going to be the first to say, who the hell am I to say what's right and wrong? Um, but I think the way you might frame the argument is like this. If your product can help any one of those three people and your marketing is weak, and you say that, hey, you're, you, you, you disclose in big, bold letters, this is a highly general, generalized product. It can work for anybody in all situations. And nobody of those three groups buys your product. Are you doing more harm than good or more good than harm? Versus if you position it as something that is tailored, you know, the, I guess the, the, the gray area or the, the midpoint is to say it's, it's designed, maybe you don't say the word specifically, it's designed for people in this situation. Oh, by the way, it also works if you do this, this, and this, but let me, let's not talk about that for a minute. Let's focus specifically on how this works for you if you're a cyclist and you focus your marketing around that. But the only way you can do that is if up front you ask your prospect a series of questions that allows you, that funnels them into that marketing funnel. So if they were to arrive on your website on the, under the keyword, you know, we'll just call it a bomb, muscle bomb, for example, muscle bomb for cyclists. Well, hell, I mean, we know who that type of person is. But if they arrive on your website after searching for the keyword muscle bomb, that tells you nothing about who the prospect is. Are they a weightlifter? Are they a cyclist? Are they a runner? What are they? Well, that's where the survey funnel idea that comes in, where you can ask them a few questions to sort of funnel them into... Uh, more focused marketing that can speak specifically to their desires, concerns, objections, and 
and benefits that they're most interested in. You know, I want to chime All in right. on that, that too. I think that it's your responsibility as a marketer because there's a difference between saying, you know, I mean, if we go back to the cyclist and runner example, there's a difference between saying this is specifically formulated just for runners versus, uh, you know, tailoring, uh, I don't know, prefontaine into your stories and your examples and your sales letter for the runners and and taking um, um, Lance Armstrong and putting him into your stories and analogies for cyclists. It doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that you're saying this was made just for you. It says it can benefit you as a runner or as a cyclist. And I think there's a big difference. And I don't think even the, the uh, sunscreen example you gave violates those ethics. They're not saying... You know, it was specifically designed, I mean, well, they're saying it's specifically designed for babies, but I think if you read the fine print, my guess is that the lawyer, their in-house lawyers allowed them to say, this works for babies, and this works for <clears throat> for everyone else, or whatever. Right. Right. Um, it's just a different label. It's not necessarily saying that, you know, we we're just doing it just for you, but it's making right. people feel that way because of how you package it. Right. All right. And I'd, I'd also like to bring up the idea of theater in marketing. Mm. Um, you know, so there's, there, th when, you, when you go to the theater, you could say it's very unethical because they're lying to you. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> these people are not actually ancient Greeks or, you know, 1950s um, high school kids. They're, they're actors. Right. Um, and yet we, we agree to suspend disbelief. And... You know, my, my background is in health and health studies and health education, and the placebo effect is essentially a form of theater whereby you, uh, you enact a ritual that increases the person's self-efficacy, their belief in themselves, their belief in their ability to make use of the product. And so to me, any, anything that makes someone more likely to say, well, this is going to work, you know, if I give someone a potion and they know it's off the shelf, they may take it, they may not. If they believe that it has been specially uh, brewed for them, they will take that potion. Right. So, you know, so, so, you know in that case, we're talking about a, a healer who has an ethical commitment to the wellness of their community. Um, so, like, you know, as you said before, with all of these forces, if, if you... If your outlook is, I am here to serve, um, you know, I would hate for some doctor to, to say, oh, well, you know, try this stuff. It might work. It might not. <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty expensive, and it's got lousy side effects. But, you know, it's, I, I read something where it helped versus, this is, you know, this is certainly going to help you. Right. Because, because the words themselves have, have magical power because of the way our brains work. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And I mean, you know, drug companies have found that it, you look at any products are becoming more and more specialized. No matter whatever, almost what, especially in consumer products and consumer consumables. You know, 30 years ago there was Coke and and Coke and Diet Coke, and 30 years before that there was Coke, Coke and no Coke. Um, go to the shelves now; they have every permutation of of Coke, Diet Coke, vanilla, cherry, cherry vanilla, cherry vanilla diet, cherry vanilla diet, caffeine free, and so. In some markets, it's a matter of, of creating different products to slice and dice the, the various segments in your market. But in other markets, it's, at the end of the day, it's really there's one solution out there. And that's the best solution. And it's the best solution for folks in a number of different situations. However, we've become accustomed to seeing something that's, we want something that's specifically geared towards us. And it's not enough now to say, this is, you know, this is the product for all things, for, all, for people in all situations. If, that, if you do that, you're going to fail. You're not going to get your message across, and people aren't going to buy your product, and they're going to be worse off as a result. So, you know, I think you know at the end of the day, um, you know, none of us are the arbiters of of what's ethical and what's not ethical. And I think you're right. You know, you we try to, hopefully, we're doing, we're acting with our, you know, with our prospects, you know, with the intent of of helping our prospect, not hurting them, and being a net contributor to society. And I think as long as you let your moral compass steer you in the right direction, I think that's that's the 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 best answer I think that um, you know any any of us could probably could probably give as to what's what's ethical and what's not ethical in um, in what you do. But 
All so right. I think so that you covers the force. Yeah. Let's. Are you, you ready to jump yeah, to the next one? Ready to close that loop? <laughs> <laughs> remember the loop? Yeah, to remember the loop. So at the beginning of the talk, we so we talked about these five forces at the beginning of the conversation. I mentioned that there's a piece of software that allows you to use all these forces and kind of wrap, wrapped up all nicely into one. And the piece of software that I want to talk about is something called Survey Funnel. And, and Survey Funnel is a simple little tool that allows you to leverage the five psychological forces that we just talked about. Now, here's what Survey Funnel does in a nutshell. Basically, Survey Funnel allows you to intelligently funnel prospects into the best match autoresponder sequence, sales page, or affiliate offer based on how they answer a series of simple multiple choice survey questions. Now, Survey Funnel is a, a WordPress plugin. It integrates with all the most popular autoresponder programs out there, everything from AWeber, Infusionsoft, GetResponse, MailChimp, Vertical Response, Eye Contact, Constant Contact, basically any, any, any autoresponder program that you might be using, Survey Funnel integrates with that. And before I talk about the plugin, because what I, what I, what's most important, I think, is how it relates to the forces that we just talked about and how you can use these forces. So, Survey Funnel, knowing what it does, the 30,000 foot level, how it intelligently funnels your prospects into the best match autoresponder sequence or offer based on how they answer a few survey questions. In terms of micro commitments, it allows you to get people on a quote unquote on ramp and build action taking momentum before they actually opt in. It allows you to introduce open loops in your marketing using the same type of examples that we talked about. It allows you to leverage that attention sweet spot because once folks opt in and they're salivating, wanting what it is that you have, you can present that to them right away. You can also use the reverse psychology of opting in, we talked about, and getting people to demonstrate that they're a good fit or, or prove to you that, they're, that they qualify simply by asking a few questions that are designed to qualify them. And you can also use the forward effect by asking a few simple questions and quote unquote customizing or personalizing the solution for the prospect, either in your marketing or presenting them with the best match product or sales letter, whatever it may be, based on how they answer those questions. So, folks are probably wondering, okay, so how does Survey Funnel work? What does it look like? Well, before we get into that, I want to mention three important, I think, interesting facts about Survey Funnel. So, Survey Funnel is a, 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 was a, a neat little project that it's a piece of software that I started using in one of my businesses before we started selling it. And when I showed it to my marketing friends, everybody said, wow, that's the coolest thing ever. And so we said, okay, well, let's run a little test and let's make this available for sale. And we priced it at a very low level, uh, geared to get it in as many hands as, as possible. It debuted on ClickBank as the number three best-selling email, uh, email marketing product out of over 100 products in that category. And two days later, it jumped to number one, and it's held that position for almost a month. And this is something that we intended, we did not intend to sell initially, we just built it for our own in-house stuff. When I showed it to Dr. Glenn Livingston, um, and I don't know how many people on this call are familiar with Dr. Glenn, but he's a marketing psychologist, and he's been featured in tons of mainstream media, everything from the New York Times to the Washington Post to the Daily News. And he, he told me that survey funnels become one of the most lucrative online techniques, and the simple plugin lets anybody use, using WordPress take advantage uh, of it. And then the third interesting fact is, I don't know who, how many people are familiar with the company AppSumo, but AppSumo is basically like Groupon for the internet marketing and technology space. It's a little startup, and it's a company that six months ago didn't exist, and in six months it's, it grew its list from nothing to 500,000 people, including over 40,000 buyers. And the founder, Noah Kagan, who is, I think, number, like, employee number 14 at Facebook and employee number three at Mint.com, really smart guy, um, at South by Southwest was on a panel. And the question was asked, well, what new piece of software are you looking at and using and do you think is really cool? And he responded by saying, Survey Funnel is now officially my new favorite piece of software. And the reason why I tell you that is because I think for anyone listening to this call, you know, you really have a couple options. Option number one is you can you know, look at your notes and hopefully people have taken some notes and you can listen to what we talked about and walk away and do nothing with it. Option number two is you can use everything that we talked about in our call and find ways to integrate it into your marketing. 
And option number three is you can check out the tool that we started talking about, which allows you to use everything that we talked about wrapped in a neat little piece of software that requires no coding whatsoever. It's the sort of thing that you can set up in just a few minutes. And it's, it's something that is, is priced at a level that, for most people, generating just one or two additional sales as a result of the software is going to more than pay for itself. We, we price this at a, at a very low level. Um, and, and for folks who are interested, I will mention one last thing, and it's, it's sort of a reason why, if you're on this call and, you, and, and you're interested, I would go ahead and check this out right now. For the next 48 hours, we've made a special deal with um, anybody on Howie and Joel's list and on this webinar to get access to the tool at uh, basically half off the publicly available price. And the reason why we did that is because we want folks to, we want to get this in as many hands as possible, and it's sort of a little way of saying thank you, and um, you know, hopefully it's the sort of thing that can make uh, as much of a difference in your business as it has in mine. And, and the last thing that I'll say is that if anybody, you know, at the beginning of the call, I mentioned, um, you know, I've made over a million dollars online using the techniques that we talked about, well, if you do not, if you're nothing more than just curious to know what that business is and to see the tool in action, I would go ahead and click on the link that you see here just to, to close that open loop. And I say that tongue in cheek. So that's what I wanted to cover. Um, I don't know if there are any questions or anything else that you guys want to talk about, but I'd be more than happy to stick around and do that. All right. Um, I just want to point out that the, the half price offer is half of what I paid. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, how he how he was how he was so excited he, he jumped right to to purchase it and I didn't I didn't even I didn't even become an affiliate and buy it for my own link <laughs> how he was uh, released. Yeah. <laughs> um, Travis wants to know if you have screenshots of the software in action um, it's 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 in the video the, the by clicking on that link you'll see a live demo of the video and uh, you'll see the the software in action. I put it this way, I've made it a point never to demonstrate software live on a webinar because um, there's another psychological force and it's highly scientific um, and it's something known as Murphy's Law. <laughs> yeah. <And> it, <laughs> when, whenever I've, whenever I've uh, demoed software or seen software demoed, um, whatever could possibly go wrong does go wrong. And so um, for anyone on this call that, that sells software, um, bear that in mind. Live demonstrations are almost always a, uh, a thing to avoid. <laughs> especially, especially when you're you're um, on a call with sketchy people who are in South Africa, and you have no idea what <laughs> shenanigans are playing on the background. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time, Howie. Yeah, well, that's, that's right. That's, that's why. I, that's why I stopped bragging about. You know, my, you know, well, never mind. <laughs> um, so, some some questions. Uh, uh -huh. T Terry, we are recording, but you know us, so uh, all, all, all bets are off. Um, really interesting question from Neil. What are the biggest surprises you've ever gotten arising from your application of the five forces? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, some surprises. Well, before implementing this, I think the biggest surprises were the net effect that they can have on your conversion rates. So. I I have a client who's in the financial services space, and he's a very high-end client. He spends over $10,000 a day in paid advertising, um, and he was getting basically cost per lead somewhere in the neighborhood of about $300 per lead. And I told him, I said, we need to take a find out if you qualify angle. We need to use that reverse psychology in your opt-in process. And he was reluctant to do it because he said, well, we're going to be turning away so many people. Um, and he operates in a, in a large mass market um, space, but his product is, is sort of like a niche product that only applies, that only works for people who, you know, their business is a certain size, they're in certain industries, et cetera, et cetera. And his argument was, I want to cast the net as wide as possible and get as many people through my door. I said, take the find out if you qualify angle, and let's see if we can prove those results. Long story short, we took his cost per lead down from $300 a lead to $45 a lead. That's not a misprint. That's not a misquote. $300 per lead to $45 per lead. Wow. 
by taking a find out if you qualify angle. So that was a surprise, not in the direction of the movement, but the magnitude of the movement. So listen, it's, it's a case of results may vary, and I'll leave with that disclaimer, but, um, and you know, test at your own risk, but you know, testing is sort of one of these finite resources that we have. We only have so much time, energy, and money to test stuff. So what I would look, uh, the way I would look at these forces as things you can test. Test the micro-commitment thing. Test using open loops. Test trying to shrink your sales letters and sales materials down to the 20-minute sweet spot so you can capture people's attention when they're in that buying frenzy or that action-taking frenzy. You try, test the reverse psychology and test the forward effect. And you know, really prove, prove it to yourself to see how this stuff works. And in some cases, it'll work phenomenally well. In other cases, it might not work. But these are variables that I'd, I'd strongly recommend at least testing in your marketing. You know, and I, I just think this is a great way of being able to test that a lot more easily. And I almost want to, I want to just give an example where I actually learned that, you know, about the takeaway and about the, um, you know, find out if you qualify type angle. It's a very hard angle to take. It takes guts. And I remember when I was at a point when I lo we had beautiful custom built 7000 square foot house and we were doing very well but not un but not well enough to and not remotely well enough to maintain that lifestyle and we lost that house and i learned a big lesson and i kind of already knew it but i didn't i wasn't necessarily enforcing it and when we lost that house not only did we lose it but the house we were going to move into fell through um, because those sellers were underwater and the bank didn't allow it to happen. So we ended up moving from a 7,000 square foot house to a 1,000 square foot two bedroom apartment. And I, uh, we were a family of four. And um, that was a demoralizing time. But I learned that lesson because, uh, you know, I was having a conversation and I had, you know, I have pretty high minimum retainers to take on new clients for, for AdWords management stuff. And I was, uh, this, uh, the CEO and I had loved each other. We were ready to work together. But the attorney was who negotiated contracts. And he was just beating me up, beating me up, beating me up and saying, well, can you work with us on your feet? Can you work with us? And the funny thing is, had I, you know, had it been a month earlier and we were still in that house and I was still kind of, clinging on to the idea of being able to, to stay in it, I would have done anything and everything to, to, to work with them. I would have dropped my fee probably by 70, 80% just to get some more money in the, in the door. Um, but since I was completely demoralized and, you know, in, luckily it was just a temporary scenario, but still, I was in a two bedroom apartment with my family of four. I didn't, I did not give a damn. So, he had to he had to impress me and you know I got to experiment that but it totally works and he wanted me because of my inflexibility because once we moved out of that house I didn't need any money we were doing just fine um, because you know our our, our uh, cash flow scenario had completely changed or not our cash uh, our cash outflow requirement had completely changed mm -hmm. but I what I love about your about your tool is that it makes it so much easier to just test those things because it does take a lot of guts to just say, you know, to to, to be able to say, we don't know if we can help you or mm -hmm. uh, find out if you can qualify because that's a scary step to do. It does so many good things. We didn't talk about it yet, but um, one of the things that on the last time that the three of us all got on the call that we started talking about is when you ask someone to when you when you ask someone to qualify themselves, you do a couple of things. Number one, if they're not a good fit for what you have, you can upfront tell them, hey, listen, you know, I don't think my product is right for you. However, I have a buddy of mine who has who works with specifically works for people with people in your situation, and let me tell you a little bit about what he does. Now that could be an affiliate offer. It could be a non-compensated way of directing someone to something that there is a better fit for them. But what it does, it's like this instant credibility booster because right up front you said, well, time out. I don't think I'm the right guy for you and I'm, and I'm not going to waste your time and I don't want to waste your time and I don't want to waste my time either. And so you, you, you can instantly establish credibility, number one. Number two, you dramatically reduce your refund rates because over time you'll find out 
which, pro which types of customers will refund, and there'll be customers that fall within similar buckets. Oh, this I went through your course and it really wasn't for me, or oh, I bought your product and it, it really wasn't for me. Well, you can stop those refunds from happening right off the bat. You lower the burden on your customer service people. So there are all sorts of tremendous sort of sideline benefits as well, in addition to everything that we've talked about, by asking someone to, to pre-qualify themselves. You can also segment your your, your audience into multiple buckets and market to them specifically because they might not want to hear about how it applies to if it's a 75 year old man who's looking to you know for that wellness thing he might not want to hear how it could help a 21 year old professional bodybuilder they just don't want to hear that and they're going to tune you out but by being able by by funneling people into buckets like this and having a tool that allows you to do it in literally 10 minutes well geez it, it allows you to do so many so much with your marketing and so you know, I think that's that's the impetus for this tool. That's that's how it was kind of how it came out was that, you know, for many folks doing the sort of thing that we're talking about, unless you have a technical background, unless you're a coder, you're uh, a developer, and you can code in PHP and jQuery and AJAX and and, and JavaScript, this, the type of thing that we're talking about is impossible. And before this tool was developed, there was nothing that was as the way Howie put it, um, it it's a tool that does one thing. And I know for many of us, the, when most software and tools out there, they, they try to do everything to, for everybody. And what happens is it becomes overwhelming to set up and it's difficult to use or it's inordinately expensive. Like, like for example, I don't know how many people use the product Survey Gizmo, which is, which is a fantastic product, by the way, but it's out of reach of mo most people. And the reason why is because it's a subscription-based software that costs at least $50 a month. Do the math, and if you have Survey Gizmo running on your site for a year, that's six hundred bucks. Five years, that's three thousand dollars just to run a survey on your site. And so our product, we price it in such a way that it's it's accessible to anybody who has a WordPress site online. I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right. We've so we've gotten several um, reports of the link not working. So I don't know why. I, I I'm not going to multitask and, and go chasing it right now. But if uh, if that's the case, we'll have to figure it out. We will send everybody um, a link, a working link, and uh, we'll. Uh, yeah, I'll have to check on that. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to leave this screen because I think it'll it'll probably mess things up. But I, I checked it before the call. It was it was working, but um, I'll check. I'll check and okay. I'll, I'll immediately after the call. I'll um, I'll respond. Uh, I'll I'll let you guys know. And uh, if it's a if it's a problem with the link, then that's fine. And if it's a problem with uh, just the way it's copying and pasting, then um, we'll, we'll figure it out. All right. Well, we're, get, we're, get, we're getting a wide variety of responses. Most people are saying it works. Some people are saying it does not. Someone's wondering if people are trying to click on the link on the screen. Um, some people yeah, are getting. Yeah, you can't. You have to. Uh, yeah, you. It, it's, some it's, people uh, are getting server. Maybe server is busy. So. Uh, so a whole uh, a whole wider array. Do you have 10,000 people on the call right now? Have you have you crashed my server? <laughs> we have we have we have less than 10,000, <laughs> but, but but more than 60. I'll just say that. Um, if you're not getting the link, it's it's because um, of reverse psychology. <laughs> no, it's honestly it's not intentional. The only thing I could I mean I tested it right before. The only thing I can think of is if um, it could be a server issue. The site is hosted on Rackspace, so it's cloud hosted and can you know, uh, handle um, huge spikes in traffic, but um, there's always a possibility that it could be something like that. Uh, well, call, call us Murphy. Uh, Mark wants to know, is there, is there training included with these concepts with the software? Yeah, so after you, so after you go through the demo, you'll see it in in action, I think it becomes a lot more concrete. It's 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 very simple software to set up, and after you order your copy in the members area, there are about don't quote me on the exact number, but I want to say about eight how-to videos on how to set everything up and, and how to get it working. And so it's um, when you see it, it's very intuitive. It's very easy to set up. Everything is managed directly within the WordPress admin. It's a WordPress plugin. So. Um, one of the most common questions or more common questions that we get is, do you have a platform neutral solution, you know, i.e. my site is not built using WordPress? The answer is not yet, but we're working on one. So um, this is specifically for folks who have a site built using WordPress. So if you've ever installed a WordPress plugin before, it's no more complicated than that. And the instructions are directly in the admin and the setup is directly in the admin. So, you know, there's no coding required, it's literally just you know, plug and play, click, 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 and the thing is set up. 
All right. And, and so, you know, it's a, I think that the, it's the sort of thing that once you see it in action, it, it answers probably a lot of the questions that, that most people might have, and it becomes very self-explanatory. Okay. Uh, Ryan, I just started to answer this to one person, but um, it, we should have you answer it for everyone. Once sure. they buy this, once they buy this uh, plugin, can they use it on multiple sites? Uh, and if so, is there a limit? The the special offer that we set up for folks who are on this call is is for the multi-site license. So the multi-site license allows you to use the plugin on an unlimited number of websites that that you own. Fantastic. So in other words, you can't go you can't go out and sell the plugin to for, you know uh, you know on your own and 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 install it on on other people's websites. But if you own a hundred different WordPress websites, the multi-site license allows you to install it on on every single one of those sites. Yes. Okay. Um, Terry wants to know if if you've heard heard of problems of the plugin working with Headway Themes 3.x.x. <laughs> um, the short answer is no. Um, the longer answer is for anyone who's concerned about something like that, a plugin conflict, a theme conflict, what I'd recommend is, you know, try to, we have a full development team, we're committed to support, um, you know, we respond to support tickets within, usually within 24 hours, sometimes within 48 hours, just depending on um, if we have a huge uh, spike of, of, of buyers. But um, put it this way, we, 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 we launched with version 1.3, we're all the way up to version 2.1. Um, because we're committed to, to kind of ironing out any 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 issues that might uh, might be there, there's always the the random thing that pops up. So I don't want to say that it's it's issue free, but it's at a point now where for 95% of buyers there are no conflicts. So so the the, the long answer is uh, install it on your site, um, try it out, and if for some reason you have problems, then we'll either work through them with you or um, if we can't get them fixed, then um, you know we'll happily give you a refund. You know we're not going to sell you something that that doesn't work. But but for 95% of of buyers, there are no issues whatsoever. Okay, um, so we got some um, entrepreneur consultants with questions like, uh, do you have a license that would allow us to sell the websites it's installed on? Yeah, I would say for that. Um, I would, I would, for, we're, we're working on putting together a devel uh, developer's license. Um, so for that, what I would say is if you go to surveyfunnel.com and you go to support, um, surveyfunnel.com forward slash support, there's an option to submit a question or inquiry. And if you just submit that question to us, um, I'll get back to you uh, separately after the call. Or someone on my team will get back to you. Okay. And I just want to talk a little bit about my experience um, setting up Survey Funnel because I, I did it twice. The first time I did it just on a, on a page that no one would ever see, just to practice, and it was very easy. Just you know, from, from a technical standpoint, to just you know, type in the questions, type in three or four multiple choice answers, and then do the next one. Um, but then I wanted to actually use it on Vitruvian Way on our consulting site. And I have to say, you know, I thought, okay, well, I want to funnel people either into AdWords management, um, AdWords audits and coaching, or classes and training. Mm -hmm. And I realized as I was doing it that it was going to be hard to do, to set up the funnel because I was not clear about what I was trying to accomplish and how I was going to, what criteria I was going to use. So it actually caused me to have to go back and you know sort of have a have a little sit down and a and a talk with myself about you know ba basically it 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 pointed out a a hole in my strategic thinking and and for that I I found it very useful that I couldn't set up the survey because I just you know I hadn't thought things out clearly enough and this really was like a um, a high beam on that um, that fuzziness in my in my thinking. You know that's that's really interesting, and I think just the one thing to add to that is um, for folks who check out the demo, you'll see that um, Survey Funnel has some high-level statistics that are contained directly within the WordPress admin. So, for example, if you ask someone a multiple-choice question and you want to know if they're if they fall in bucket A, B, or C, 
and you think that those are your three biggest segments, your three most important segments. Well, you can run the survey funnel for a week or two and send traffic to a page that has a survey funnel. You might be surprised with what you find. You might be surprised to find that, well, holy smokes, 80% of my, my, my market is actually falling in bucket A, and B and C aren't the most important buckets. Maybe I need to figure out what the three most important buckets are. Maybe I need to ask people in segment A, you know, what, which of the following best describes them, and, and rethink you know, your whole marketing. And so what it can do, to, to just extend the point that you just brought up, is it can open your eyes to things you might not realize about your market. And so it's, it's again, it's one of these sideline benefits. Um, number two is it can you know, also highlight or put the high beams on the differences in conversion rates among those segments. So you might have A, B, and C. Well, maybe your conversion rates for segment A are 10%, but for B and C, it's 5%. And so what that tells you is either A, those, those B and C segments are not as responsive, or maybe your marketing needs to be uh, improved uh, to capture the, 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 that, the, that segment of the market that you're, that you're not doing a good job of, uh, of, of capitalizing on. Great. Are there any, I'm happy to stay on as, as, uh, as long as necessary, but um, are there any rounding at the, I think at the, if my math is right, the 90 minute mark, are there any other um, questions that? Yeah, there's, that there's a question there? about um, Google AdWords. Okay. Joel, Joel you've heard of that. Um, where does a survey compliant? page, yes, is it, is it for landing pages? You know, okay, so. You know, I'm going to answer that question by saying, you know, like anything, use at your own risk. Um, you know, I'm not a Google employee. I don't, I, uh, you know, I don't know what, you know, what their current principles and 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 rules are um, about, you know, landing page pop-ups and that sort of thing. But I'll tell you, in my professional opinion, um, you know, in in a held harmless sort of way, um, I use this. I send paid traffic through Google to pages that have survey funnels on them. And the reason why I think it's okay, and again, this is just, a, this is just a, an opinion, and it's not a fact, and so it's, you know, use it at your own risk. I don't want anybody coming back to me saying, I use this and AdWords shut me down. But my, my rationale for why this is okay is because it's a user-engaged event. So in other words, you're not auto-popping up anything when a user lands on your landing page. They actually have to either click on a link, click on a button, click on a graphic, click on a side tab to elicit this pop-up. So in that way, it's no different in my mind than asking someone to click on a link to start a video playing and to pop that up. So it's not auto-playing, it's not intrusive or invasive in any way. You're inviting the user to take an action and you're giving them the option to take that action. So that's my professional opinion and, and I use it in my own marketing. Um, beyond that, I think that's that's probably the extent to which I could comment on um, you know is it Google compliant yes or no, is that is that fair enough? And I'll I'll chime in just to to reinforce that too. And I think Ryan, you're right. I've never thought about it from the fact that it, you know technically it's a pop up, but it's when they click on you know show me more information. Um, and Google's requirement is that pop ups are perfectly allowed just not on the landing page you drive traffic to. So if, you know, if they click and go anywhere, pop-ups, you can do them all you want. They just don't allow it on the landing page that you send traffic to. And I think by you having that only pop-up once they click on a show me more information link, I think, I th I think you're exactly right that that's still, that qualifies as being after, you know, it's not shoved in their face the second they drop on your website. So right. I would, I mean, I would second listen, that. It's, it's, and, and Google's, you know, their view on this is not in a vacuum. If you're selling, you know, uh, forced continuity Viagra subscriptions or mail order brides from Russia, you know, they're going to look at you under the microscope. If you're selling some innocuous, um, you know, product that's, that's not under the FTC's, um, you know, sort of range of industries that are considered high risk, well, you have a lot more leeway. So. You know, I, I think it's it's the context of the context in which you're using any piece of software or your site in general um, is just as important um, as uh, the actual application of it. 
I mean, if you're selling mail order brides from Russia, Google's going to look at you very closely. If you're selling, um, you, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, tomato plants from a nursery, you know, they're going to be a lot less. They're going to be a lot more forgiving. Right. Although, you know, if, you, if you're doing uh, mail order brides, then uh, you should have mention of Viagra for the semantic web. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a cross-sell, upsell opportunity, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Plus, it also works for for tomato plants. Um, there's <laughs> Ian, Ian um, thro throws out a what he th may thinks may be a competitive product and asking for a comparison. I've never okay. heard of this. It's um, Rob Jones opt-in funnel software. Which I think this is offered on the Warrior forum. Yeah, I've, I've never heard of that. Not familiar with it. Okay. Okay. The main the main difference, as far as I'm concerned, is if you buy Rob's product, we don't get any money. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if that's not a good enough reason, then I don't know what is. Yeah. Thank Howie for putting this together. It's a lot. It's a it's a lot of work to to put together a webinar from when you're in the uh, in the jungle in Africa somewhere, and there are lions roaming outside your 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 tent. What do they call those tents? And uh, not a hopa. What's the word? Oh, well, I'm in a you know, two I'm, two story three bedroom house. So. I'm 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 saying it tongue in cheek, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yurt. Yeah. No. The uh, the the amazing thing about the wildlife here, I find, is that the the baboons like to poop right in the middle of the road. It's like they're <laughs> they're they're smart enough to like to to give the middle finger to Western civilization. <laughs> That's funny. So. So may maybe that's what the note we should end on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on that note, baboon poop, we're going to wrap things up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so th thank you so much, Ryan. Cool. Uh, now, did we get confirmation? Is that link working? Or um, I'll check it either way. But um, it's, it's working for some and not for others. Okay. Um, I have to so make sure we'll, the, Howie is, the Howie is lowercase. Um, sometimes people do that, make sure it's spelled correctly. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take a look after the call, and I'll, I'll send something to you one way or the other, so that way um, we can get a link out and uh, a confirmed link that is, in fact, working. Yeah, and let's – I got I got through to it fine, but just looking for you know basic things. I exactly that people may be putting a capital H for Howie in there that wouldn't work. Um, and this feels silly because I can't think of any misspellings, but I'm going to do it anyway. S U R V E Y F U N N E L dot com. Um, who knows? There may be you know it it might not be a clear picture, so maybe people are seeing it differently. Yeah, um, that's a good point. So uh, surveyfunnel.com slash Howie, all lowercase. That should be working, and we'll, we'll try to figure it out on the back end before we mail what uh, hopefully recorded for this great webinar. <laughs> right. what, awesome. One hand, some, some folks are saying that there is a – that link, which is an easy type link, redirects to the same link, you know, Howie, and then hyphen special. So, oh, yeah, that, that's correct. That's correct. So, we short, we so some, people are saying, some people are saying that the redirect wasn't working, that the, that the Howie special works. And, you know, I've always been told that I was special, so. <laughs> Howie is special. Howie is special. It's the same link. We just shortened it for, um, for the purpose of the webinar to make it um, as easy to remember and type in as possible. So, right. yeah, folks are in the right place. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And, Thanks so much. It's a lot of fun. Thank All you, right, Ryan. Catch you all soon. <laughs> All right, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.